All right, thank you. I hope everyone had a good lunch and is uh, now at least a little psyched up for some security issues. So I'm going to cover some of the most uh, frequent security issues and try to put them in a groovy ecosystem related context, so typically with Ratpack and, uh, and Grails. So the agenda is we're going to look at the security issues, but I'm also going to cover a few tools that can help us try to avoid these, uh, these issues. So my name is, uh, is Jakob Mikkelsen. I'm a senior software architect at uh, Cartley, which is a small uh, fintech startup. Small, we're now 30 plus employees. And we're PCI DSS uh, certified, which means we have a lot of different security processes and a lot of testing we have to go through to, uh, to handle the, this. I'm also an external associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark, where I teach networks and security. So that's kind of the background. Uh, the orange suit kind of gives me my way that I'm also, a, also a, an organizing team member of the Great Conf and, and generally just a groovy ecosystem nerd. So The goal is learn or hopefully refresh some of these uh, security issues. In the optimum dream world, everything I say you would know and never make any of these mistakes. Uh, and I hope we also have a little bit of fun seeing some of my terrible, terrible code into how could, how could this uh, disappear. So just a disclaimer, you will see code and practices that are not recommended as part of introducing this, these security issues uh, that we'll encounter. And if you have any questions, please t feel free to, uh, to interrupt me uh, instead of waiting to the, uh, to the very end. I have probably enough material, so, uh, so, so I won't, uh, won't make it to the question section anyway, but I'll try. So let's get started. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and roughly every third year, they publish a top 10 list of the most, uh, most frequently occurring and serious uh, problems within the security space in uh, web applications. And, and they consider quite a different uh, number of factors, from the attack vectors to whatever uh, weaknesses we have, to whatever controls of security we have, to what technical impact and what business impact we can have. So they have four criteria, and those are the four criteria that, that, that are used to indicate whether this, should be, whether this is a problem or what. So the likelihood of an application having that vulnerability, so the prevalence, the likelihood of an attacker discovering that vulnerability, so the detectability, and the likelihood of an attacker successfully exploiting that vulnerability, and then the typical technical impact if this is in fact uh, uh, exploited. So the number one serious problem is injection. And that be uh, SQL injection, operating system injection, LDAP injection. So whenever untrusted data is sent and being interpreted as part of a command or query, um, and this can, this can really do bad, uh, bad things. So, for example, if you don't uh, use uh, prepared statements when doing, uh, doing SQL, and you just do horrible stuff like dumping your request parameters directly into your SQL, well, anyone with a little bit of uh, SQL knowledge will be able to bypass uh, this. And here, you'll be able to log in. So. I don't know how many of you read uh, reads, uh, XKCD, but uh, this one is uh, one of the epic classics, I think. Um, so in a Gorn context, is, is this even a problem? Well, yes and no. So no, because if we just, just use dynamic finders, everything's automatically escaped. So we won't run into these problems. But Gorn being very flexible, you have the option of doing manual HQL queries. So you could say, from my user at you, where you use a name, and then you just dump in whatever, uh, whatever parameter was, uh, was given to you. If you do it like that, you shouldn't. Because this, this suffers from the, uh, the SQL injection uh, capability. And even the readability from this is horrible, so why, wouldn't, why, why not just use GORM as it was intended to do with the dynamic, uh, dynamic finder for this? Uh, for command injections? It is possible, it's not, not totally trivial, and, and luckily enough, 
you can't uh, you can't do really uh, really long uh, uh, commands. Anything with the with the ampersands are 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 being blocked, so you only get the first part. But this, in fact, works if I dump it in a controller in Rails and uh, ship off uh, a command to it. I don't know why on God's green earth you'd want to do this, but but you can. So. Second, uh, second word thing is broken authentication. And this has to do with the application functions related to authentication and session management, and are often implemented incorrectly, allowing attackers to compromise passwords, keys, or session token, or to exploit other implementation flaws to assume other users' identities temporarily or permanently. So I, are, we were, are we vulnerable to this? Well. If you permit automated attacks such as credential stuffing, where the attacker has a list of valid usernames and passwords, yes, you're, uh, you're vulnerable. If, if you don't protect yourself against uh, brute force attacks, you're potentially vulnerable. Uh, permits default weak or well-known passwords, such as password1 or, or the famous admin admin. Um, uses weak or, or ineffective credential recovery or forgotten password processes. So, for example, these knowledge-based uh, answers. I've hacked my father's email account from my mother several times because, rightfully so, he's a sailor, so not always available. And, and it's pretty easy when, when the question is, oh, what was the name of your first dog? Well, that's rather common knowledge if you know my father, so it's not really security-related there, not, not good security. Plain takes the weekly hashed passwords. So how many here is using Spring Security? How many here has used Spring Security for a number of years? What, pass what algorithm is used in Spring Security? No one really seems to care. We just trust that Spring Security is doing a good job. So nowadays, it's, it's bcrypt. But back a few years ago, it was actually a different algorithm. So if you have a legacy system, you can, you can configure exactly what algorithm should be used, but it's one of these things, people start to get pale when you ask them, oh, what is the underlying stuff here? We don't, we just trust it. Um, so some of, the, uh, some of the examples is also continued use of passwords. It's really a bad practice. So once it was this recommended password, yet you must rotate your password every three, uh, one or three months. And that's fantastic. What does everyone, everyone do? Add in a number in the end, and then you just increment. Well, did that increase your security? No, because an attacker also knows, well, that's how most people do. So now, instead of having a length 8 password, you basically have a length 7 password, knowing the last one's probably a digit. You reduce your security by this. So use multi-factor authentication. That's the recommended practice uh, by now instead. Don't ever put the session ID in the URL. This would be one of the examples uh, where you could have uh, bought a, a ticket for going to Hawaii, and this would be fantastic. You put it on on Facebook. Hey, I'm going to Hawaii. Anyone clicking this link now has your session and could, well, change the name so they would be going to Hawaii. Um, Sensitive data exposure is where many web applications don't properly protect sensitive data, such as credit cards, tax IDs, and authentication credentials. And of course, if anyone uh, steals or modifies such protected data, well, then we have a bad crime. Be sure to always use encryption when at rest or in transit, as well as special precautions when exchanged with the browser. So always use HTTPS. That's a, that's a dead given. First point on the list, how many here uses encryption in their backups when they do a database dump? I see a show of hands, so thanks to, uh, to Andre up there. Um, is any of the data transmitted in clear text internally or externally? Especially when you're on the internet, if you don't do encryption, just consider it shouting it to the world. Uh, again, the cryptographic algorithms. If you have used Spring Security for a number of years and you use an old algorithm, it's, it's not a trivial task to update a hashing algorithm in your credential system because, well, you don't know what the password is. So you can't just, oh, I'm just going to hash it with a different algorithm. So it will take time to, uh, to do this, but it can be done. Um, this one is one of the, these points where I am very interested to see 
whether this point is so high on the list next time it will be published due to the GDPR. In reality, it should have totally vanish from the list, at least in, in Europe. But in reality, I, I doubt it. I think it will, uh, will end up there. So back in the days, it was rather useful. Uh, it was expensive to buy SSL certificate. So some companies just protected half of their sites, just the, uh, just the shop part. That would run SSL, and everything else didn't have to. So if, if that's the case, you can monitor web traffic, and then you can steal, uh, steal the cookies whenever you're in an, an unprotected part of the site. So use SSL everywhere. Um, XML, external entities. This is one of the new things on the latest uh, of West Blisp. Uh, Many old and poorly configured XML processes evaluate uh, external entity reference within the XML documents. And, and that can then happen with, uh, with, with a lot of nasty things. So especially SOAP prior to version 1.2 has uh, some of these annoying, uh, annoying attacks. And I think some of the examples are, are the best. If you want to do a, a uh, not even a distributed denial of service, just a denial of service attack, the billion laugh attack is one of the easiest. So what, what you have is, you have lol. Then you have lol1, which includes lol a lot of times. Then you have lol2, which includes lol1, which includes lol. And then you just continue there, and, and you have a very, very, very large amount of lol when you interpret lol9. So a few requests of these, and the server just dies in the processing. Could also be that we're just trying to uh, to up, uh, trying to uh, include a potentially endless file. So, if you use uh, dev random, it has a lot of bits. It doesn't just doesn't stop. So, that's uh, that's one way. Or you could try to extract data from uh, from the server, reading files that you shouldn't have uh, have access to. So, some nasty attacks there, but up updating to to the latest uh, XML parsers will solve these. So. Broken access control, so restrictions on what authenticated users are allowed to do are often not uh, properly enforced. So just, just because you don't expose it in your front end doesn't mean that your back end shouldn't take care of security. You need to take care of this, uh, this both, uh, both places. Um, and this is really a core skill set of, uh, of uh, the hacking community. So some of, some of these are bypassing access control checks by modifying the URL and the internal application state or the HTML page to simply using a custom API attack tool. Um, if you allow the primary key to be changed to another user's record and then permitting viewing and editing someone else's account, that's of course a, a nasty vulnerability. Um, elevation of privilege, privilege, if you're acting as a user without uh, being logged in, or acting as an admin when logged in as a user. And here, the course uh, misconfiguration could also allow un uh, unauthorized API access. So some, uh, an example here is, now we're at least using a prepared statement, but, but we still put in, uh, put in the, uh, the query from the account. And if you then say, well, I can guess someone else's account, if you don't protect that, that you're allowed to see whatever is inserted there, you have a flaw. Uh, with Grails and Gorm, this is actually one of these where, by, def by design, if you use scaffolding in Grails, you automatically expose the ID in the database. And it's just, an inch, uh, it's just a long. So it's rather easy to guess what might be the other user's ID. If you use Mongo, luckily it's a, it's a UUID, which makes it, makes it significantly harder. It's one of these things where, where, especially in Grails, exposing the, uh, the database uh, ID in the URLs, you really need to make sure that you've protected yourself. Security misconfiguration? Well, good security requires having a secure configuration defined and deployed for the application, the framework, the application server, the web server, database server, platform, and containers. Uh, secure settings should be defined, implemented, and maintained as defaults are often insecure. Additionally, software should be kept up to date. So are we, are we vulnerable here? Is any of your software out of date? No, of course, we patches everything, right? <coughs> yeah. 
uh, including the operating system. How often do you, how, how many in here uses Docker? That's a few. How often do you rebuild your container, updating the operating system there? My guess, when you do a new release. So are we patching the operating system in general? Containerization there often goes the opposite way around. So you actually have to rebuild those containers to get the latest, uh, latest updates. Um, are any unnecessary features enabled or installed? For example, ports, services, pages, accounts, and privileges? Tomcat usually comes with a nice uh, admin uh, interface. A lot of, lot of places I've seen, oh yeah, yeah, we haven't really touched that. I don't know really what it is. Um, does your error handling reveal stack traces or uh, other overly uh, informative error messages to users? Well, at least in Grails, this is one of the pro. So if it's in development, you get to see the entire stack trace. If, if you're, uh, you're not in development, you just get this, an error has occurred. That's at least, by default, a very good design choice. Even better would be that, that you had a token you could tell to the user, oh, please inform us of this token in case you, uh, you report the error to the, uh, to the help desk. Uh, with Grails and Docker, uh, there's a really nice guide by the, uh, by the Grail teams on, on how to Dockerize your, uh, your Grails application. And that's awesome, it's easy to do. There's just this little bud. It runs the application as root user. So my guess is there's a lot of Grails applications out there where we just followed the guide and now we run the web server as root. Might be in the container, but why would you ever want to run as root in your container? I, I personally don't think there's anything Grails need to be root for in my, uh, in my application. So you can fix this just by inserting these two small commands. So run a command that adds a group, adds a user, put that, group, that user in the group, and then tell Docker, please continue as my app user. Now you're no longer root. Uh, other typical examples are if you have uh, an Apache server and directory listings is not disabled on your server, then, uh, then that allows the attacker to discover uh, the, the possibility to list directory and, uh, and find any file that you want. Then you can download compiled uh, Java classes, decompile those, reverse engineer them, and if you have the code, op options or possibilities of finding flaws are significantly higher. Um, the sample application that is not being removed from production servers, uh, it's, uh, that's an, uh, a different uh, way of getting in. So, this one I was rather surprised that it had dropped down the list on cross-site scripting. Uh, so cross-site scripting flaws occur when an application takes untrusted data and sends it to a web browser without proper validation and escaping. And cross-site scripting allows attackers to execute scripts in the victim's browser, which can hijack user session, deface websites, or redirect the user to malicious sites. So an example here is we output some, uh, some uh, HTML and we just take whatever they have in inputted and display it directly. If you modify the, uh, the CC parameter here, we can insert a script that says, oh, document.location, please feed me with all of the, uh, the cookie material you have on this, uh, this site, likely including the session ID. So, in Grails, are we, uh, are we vulnerable? Well, not usually, but there is this nice thing, static default encode as, for the tag lib, HTML. A lot of people don't necessarily know what that is or why it's there, so I've seen a lot of times that's just been deleted. So you can explain that you want HTML or you want none. If you, if you say none, you need to be really careful because it will just display whatever you give it. If you have to output HTML, then you might be forced to doing this, but then if there's any user input, you need to take really, uh, really care of that. In the view technology, in, uh, in the GSP in general, if you have to, do, if you have to be vulnerable, well, you have to do something like 
explicitly ta- say, I want the raw In Rat Pack, Rat Pack, if you do use Lazy Bone to generate a, a Rat Pack application, you get the uh, markup template module. That actually took me some, uh, some Google foo to figure out how to make Rat Pack uh, vulnerable to these injections. By default, the markup template module escapes everything. But you can, if, if you really, really want it, put in this uh, configuration closure, which says auto escape equals false. That way, now you're open to cross-site uh, site scripting. Probably not what you want, but if you, if you generate HTML in a, uh, in a server, uh, service or anything that you want then displayed, then this, is a, this would be the way to do it. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Insecure deserialization is when uh, deserialization leads to remote uh, code execution. Even if deserialization flaws do not result in remote code execution, they can be used to perform attacks, including replay attacks, injection attack, and privilege escalation attacks. So this entered the top 10 based on industry service, so aka okay, what, uh, what the business have actually been exposed to. Um, so there are two, uh, two primary types of attacks, uh, object and data structure related attacks, And, and typical data tampering attacks, uh, such as access control related, uh, related attacks. Um, an example could be that we have a React application that calls a set of uh, Spring Boot microservices. We don't do Grails microservices in, a, uh, in, a, in an insecure way. So, uh, Being functional programmers, we really try to do uh, a, a immutable state uh, in the code all of the time. And the solution that was, uh, that was brought up was, oh, so we just serialize user state and pass it back and forth with each request. In that way, we can scale in a nice, uh, nice horizontal way. We have everything we need. An attacker then can notice that the ROO, Java Object Signature, used the Java Serial Killer tool to gain remote code execution on the application server, because it knows now everything about the user state. Uh, PHP, always a nice, uh, nice framework for doing uh, security-related things. It is, I prepped a workshop for the Gretsch conference, and I, I previously have given, uh, given security workshops using a PHP framework. So I thought, how long will it take me to, to do a Grails application with all of these nasty security holes I already had the PHP code for? And it turned out, it took significantly longer. So in PHP, it's roughly just coded like 14-year-old Jacob would have done, and it's flawed. By default, it's flawed. In, in Grails, by default, everything is secure, so you have to really sometimes twist the arm around the Grails framework to get, uh, to get it to be, uh, be as insecure. So, back to PHP. An object uh, serialization to save a super cookie containing the user's uh, ID, role, password, hash, and other state, and you would be able to just switch out user with admin, suddenly you, do, you have a different access. I don't know who would, who would do this, but again, don't. Using components with known vulnerabilities. So components such as frame, uh, frameworks, libraries, and other software modules almost always run with full privileges, especially if you do Docker. Uh, if a vulnerable component is exploited, such an, uh, such an attack can f uh, facilitate serious data loss and server takeover. So, components usually run with the, uh, with the same privilege as, as the application, so, so any flaw can be rather, uh, rather uh, accidental or intentional. So if you have a coder that uh, quits the company th and thinks, oh, I want the back door in here if they don't pay me the, the last salary, well, then that's intentional, or it could be accidental by coding error. So, if you don't know, all the versions of the components that you use, both client-side and server-side. Potentially, some of these are not updated and have flaws. Uh, if you don't scan for vulnerabilities regularly and subscribe to security bulletins related to the components you use, you might not see or might not hear if something is, uh, 
is flawed. If you do not fix and upgrade the underlying platform, the frameworks and the dependencies in a risk-based, timely fashion, you're potentially vulnerable. This is one of these items where most, most companies, when you say it, it's like, yeah, yeah, well, we should probably start doing that. Uh, so one example was a, a struts2 remote code execution vulnerability that enabled execution of arbitrary code on the server. That has been blamed for significant security breaches. It's been patched, but there's still, there's still software out there running with it. Um, lots of automated tools are available in the, uh, in the hacking world to find unpatched and uh, misconfigured systems. For example, the Shodan EOT search engine that can help you find devices that still suffer from the Heartbleed vulnerability, and that was patched back in 2014. Uh, anyone here uses the Fields plugin? All right. Anyone here uses the Fields plugin that have updated their application recently? Like in the last five or six days? All right. You are, you are potentially suffering from a security risk. Uh, the, uh, the Grails field plugin, even the one that is in the current package, if you use the uh, web profile, suffers from a uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, this is a brand new uh, Grails application and did it uh, did yesterday, uh, just with one uh, one class, uh, one domain class, and it uh, it's a just have a fun text string. So if I insert anything with a script tag and I create it, it gets, uh, it gets executed. So how can we patch it? Well, uh, the Grails team uh, submitted a, pu a pull request for, uh, for the Fields plugin uh, almost immediately. So what you can do, even if you use the, uh, the web profile, is you can explicitly say, oh, I might better update this to Grails, uh, uh, the Fields plugin 228. If you do that, and we restart the fun here. Oh, I should have done this with Micronaut. It would have been, been ready now. Come on, you can do it. Go Grails. I should have prepped a joke for that uh, that time, all right. So, new demo, I can do the exact same input, and now it just gets displayed. So, it has been fixed, but there was a couple of guys there that uh, that have a potential task. It's in the display uh, uh, method of the fields plugin. All right, back to, uh, back to this one. Uh, insufficient logging and monitoring. If, uh, if you just run, uh, run your application and say, all right, if it goes down, some customer will probably uh, call me and inform me and I can, uh, I can spin it up uh, back up again. And you don't do sufficient logging. You might not be aware if you're under attack. Attacks nowadays, an average attack from, uh, from a serious hacker is usually carried out in, in a span of 200 days. They know that, that just just hammering you away will alert a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, operation teams. But if they do it over a long period of time and you don't have sufficient monitoring from this, well, you're potentially, uh, potentially under attack and you don't even know it. Um, so you could be vulnerable if uh, warnings or errors generate no or inadequate or unclear log transactions, uh, log messages. If uh, the logs of your application is only stored locally, if you don't aggregate them, you don't monitor them. Uh, if penetration testing and scan, uh, scans by automated tools do not trigger alerts, you likely could be under attack without even knowing it. Um, so a lot of different, uh, different ways. This is actually from one of the logs from, uh, from my, uh, one of my Grails application, where I could see, wait a second, Someone was trying some weird patterns in my login. So I had to, to blacklist a couple of IP uh, addresses to, uh, to at least get rid of that. Uh -huh. So 
So it re it depends a little bit on on what. Uh, so if it's a SSH and you see a lot of uh, login attempts, you should of course uh, configure SSH so you can only have access with a valid certificate. Well, the, it really depends on your type of business. I have been employed by a TV station, uh, which website was in Danish. And one of the remedies there was, for a period of time while being, being under attack, we, j we blocked every, any IP address that was not coming from Denmark. Usually that, uh, that, that stops it, and then at some period in time they give up and, and move on to a new, uh, new target, and you can switch it off again. But it, it, it re it's really a situation-to-situation situation, uh, dependent uh, question. But if you don't monitor, you don't know that, that you're potentially being under attack or you have issues. Um, so on the previous list, uh, cross-site request forgery was, uh, was on it and unvalidated redirect and forward. Uh, they actually explicitly in the report mentioned that cross-site request forgery almost made the list, so it is number 11, likely. Um, so, a little bit on tools. This is my favorite Gradle plugin. The uh, Gradle versions uh, plugin by, uh, by Ben Mains. You can, uh, you can install it just with, uh, with an, uh, an ID block and use Gradle wrapper dependency updates. Then you get a report like this. So, these updates here are using the latest milestone. So, those check marks. You can't update any of those. But you also, also occasionally get something like this. The following dependencies have later milestones versions. It's a very easy way to see has anything been released on the dependencies that I'm using? These are very potential candidates to have, uh, to have uh, security patches. So if if they, are, they are minor or patches, I recommend uh, trying to do the upgrade uh, immediately. Um, if you can't see exactly where dependency is coming from, just a, a friendly reminder that, that the Gradle wrapper has the, uh, the Gradle has the uh, dependencies uh, task too, which explicitly details all, the, all of the dependencies, including transitive dependencies. Um, there's a different, uh, different Gradle plugin where you, can, uh, yeah, where you can do dependency checks. The, uh, the uh, OWASP dependency check for Gradle. Uh, that when, when you run this with dependency check analyze, uh, you get a nice report. And this is really a strong feature. It uses, uh, uses all the CV, uh, CV, uh, CSVs, CVs, the, uh, the uh, reports on security issues, scans those and see is there any technology in there that, uh, that is vulnerable. The problem is a little bit that, that when you do it, you get a lot of different, uh, different uh, false positives. So, Groovy, oh, you're using Groovy, so you have a potential security flaw, because there somewhere in, in, in all versions of Groovy is something with, which probably is not something you use. But, but you get all of these warnings. So it's really, really hard to use it in practice, because basically everything shows up in the, uh, in, the uh, in the report as being a problem. You can silence, uh, silence things, so, so it, it is possible to use it, but, but it really takes some, uh, some time and massaging to get, uh, get it working. The tool that I'm, I'm going to demo for you is the OVASP uh, Set Attack Proxy Project. Um, some of the important features is it can run in active mode and it can run in passive mode. It has a spider, so it automatically checks all of the uh, all of the uh, DOM from your website. See where's the links to, so it gets around in the entire uh, application. Also checking sites that you might not uh, not even know is there, and then it generates a a, a nice uh, nice report. So in Firefox, it's pretty simple to set up a uh, a proxy. So, running the uh, the SAP project on your machine, you can proxy anything in fi uh, from Firefox directly through this uh, this project. So it looks uh, something like this. Let's start a new session. Uh, that's okay. No, I don't want to persist it. So, as you see up here, there's no uh, there's no sites. If I go to uh, Firefox, 
And I open a oh, demo dot here. This is a, a horrible application which uh, has many, many, many very useful features. For example, a pirate name generator. So let's see what uh, Jalom would be calling himself as a pirate. He would call him Jalom Uh It has very many completely utterly useless uh, tools and all of these tools suffer from a horrible amount of uh, security issues. Um, but when crawling around here, we go down here. Did I manage to disable? Proxy, yes, thanks. It should in fact, oh, there we go. Just need to fold it up. So here, as you can see, demo.gruzgate.org, the site that it was surfing around on, it by proxying through, it just listens and detects silently what is going on. So it learns a little bit about the uh, the site, um, and it comes with a, with a few uh, recommendations. So there's a medium here uh, on a GET request. Um, so that's the first line of defense that you can have. You can silently let it monitor, but that's not really fun. The uh, the fun part is when we do an active scan. So we can take the uh, take the website and let me just... So here there's an empty contact list. Um, so if I ask the tool to please try to scan this and just disclaimer, don't do this on production unless you've alerted uh, people that, uh, that listen to, for example, an input, f uh, input form, because it will, in fact, do, uh, do a significant amount of, uh, of fun. My, uh, my marketing department at my current company was rather, rather curious about why the 1,274 mails in the contact formula, because we, by accident, tried to scan the website without letting them, letting them know. Um, not, not the best success. Um, so, as you can see, it does an active scan and does all of these uh, all of these nice ones, and we can see what alerts do we have. So, cookies, no HTTP only flag, password autocomplete, uh, X frame header not set. It will it will likely find some uh, some nasty uh, nasty stuff since uh, since this one. Uh, is uh, is vulnerable to a lot of things. So as you can see in the uh, in the previously empty uh, empty list, now it tries out uh, all the different combinations with all of the uh, random stuff. See here, tries to get access to the system dot any file on Windows. Well, this is not running Windows, so it's of course not successful. But but it's a good. Uh, sometimes it reveals nicely what attackers could uh, could try to uh, try to do to you. So inject some uh, some query parameters and stuff. It's really really easy to download and set up. It takes uh, it takes a few minutes, and and scanning even your application locally sometimes reveals some uh, some very nice uh, nice things. Uh, web browser cross site uh, scripting protection not enabled. These are potentially low hanging fruit. It has a lot of info into what is the the uh, problem. It has some recommended solutions, so it's a really neat tool. Uh, all right, let's get back to Chrome. There we go. Uh, even better, it runs in headless mode and API based. There's a Jenkins plugin for it, so you can incorporate this into your, uh, your pipeline. So every time you do a release, you can scan at your, at your uh, CI uh, server and make sure that you do have not introduced anything uh, anything low hanging so i recommend to uh, to take a look at that in uh, in the process of it i've included a bit of uh, literature as to what i've uh, talked about and it's open for question yeah Mm. 
Potentially, I th so so given that a lot of a lot of the websites are made with React, a lot of those are also API based. So so as long as you expose your API, problem is that you sometimes could could reveal things in the front end like passwords and uh, and and access tokens that IDs all the, all the fun stuff. Uh, but I. I don't think it's React's fault that the world has become more insecure. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Thank you. Remember that uh, you can rate the talk, you can rate the conference from uh, from inside the uh, the Great Conf website. If you log in, then on the uh, agenda site, there's a small heart. It takes some uh, takes some searching to find it. I realized, but we'll uh, we'll try to get that better for next year. Thank you.